So welcome to all of you who are joining us on this call. Uh, we'll just give it a few minutes um, to let people join. We'll just give it another minute and then we'll, we will start. Okay. A few minutes past, so I, I'm going to start our At Home With event. I'm Gillian nash Canell, HR Director for Roy Thorns, and welcome all of you to our At Home With event. Um, it's a virtual event this year. We have previously held this event in person um, at our Spalding office. However, due to the challenges of the pandemic, we decided we should hold a virtual session uh, this year. Um, the schedule has changed, I'm afraid, because unfortunately, even holding this event virtually, it's still been impacted uh, by COVID. As the representative we were hoping uh, would speak to you from Foraging Fox is unable to join us uh, this afternoon due to ill health. So, however, we will still plan to bring you um, an insight into what it's like to work at Roy Thorns, uh, what it's like to be a trainee with us, and our application process. So along with other topics that I'm sure the, the panel will, will discuss. So as you'll see from the schedule, um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of an intro introduction to Roy Thorns, and then we're gonna have a panel discussion with the people that you hopefully can see on your screen that I'll introduce a bit later. Um, and then we're going to look through the application process and how you can apply to us for a training contract and then an opportunity to ask us any questions. You are all currently on mute. However, if you have any questions, please do just type it in uh, to the question box and we will look at them as we're going along. So, who are we? Well, we started um, in, in the 1930s, in 1934, as the, as the slide says. Um, Really, it was established over 87 years ago by Mr. Roy Thorns to support those that were in the shooting and gaming uh, or game uh, communities to help them really uh, rectify um, the disputes that might happen where people were going across many landowners' fields and in terms of facilitate those activities. The firm developed quite quickly into specialist agricultural property and food and later on uh, ha has developed into other areas which I'll, I'll talk about. So you might ask yourself, um, why are we still in Spalding over the last, you know, 87 years later. Well, it is really to be uh, close to our client base. So the reasons we initially started at home with event was so that those people that aren't from the area could have an idea of what Spalding is like, because many of you won't have visited it. And actually, we have a lot of big businesses around us. And in terms of you know, commercial businesses that have grown out of the agricultural sector. So I thought I'd give you some fun facts about Spalding in terms of uh, our agricultural and food sectors. So over 75,000 people um, are employed in the agri-food sector in Lincolnshire. 30% of UK food travels through Lincolnshire. So 30% of what we eat in the UK comes through Spalding and Lincolnshire in some shape or form. 30% of the UK 
veg and 18% of the UK poultry is from Lincolnshire. And for those avocado lovers amongst you, two thirds of all UK avocados have sometimes been in Spalding. So as far as why are we still in Spalding, actually our client base is still all in Spalding as well. And they have grown and we've grown with them. And on the slide at the moment, you can see a picture of our purpose-built offices that we moved into in uh, 2009. And, you know, as I say, one of the points of having a home with event was to bring to life why we're still in Spalding, really. And you might have assumed, you know, it's a, it's a small office, but as you can see, it's not. In terms of since then, we've grown and we're now a, a other offices around and certainly most recently milestones have been Alconbury and Birmingham. We've developed our client base since the early days and farmers have diversified and so we have they've become uh, specialists in other industries so farmers and landowners have moved into housing and development and natural resources such as solar farms and we've developed those sectors around them. And some of the farmers uh, and landed estates now are big commercial businesses. We still have what we refer to as the green welly farmers who are, are still doing the traditional farming. However, we have many that are now big businesses. So other milestones in Roythorns um, is that we do pride ourselves on having great tech. And in October, before the pandemic, so 2019, our IT director had obviously done something good in a previous life uh, because he had decided to give us all laptops, all Fiona's laptops and most of the support staff. So when the pandemic hit uh, in 2020, we were perhaps a, a bit ahead of the game because we'd already started to establish agile working. And so that meant we had a relatively easy transition into home working and we still continue to work a hybrid model. What we will do in the future, who knows? It depends what the pandemic does. But certainly Roythorns has a, from a technology point of view, always embraced the new tech. So just because we're based in Spalding, we, we wanted to, to bring that to life to you that actually compared to some of our big counterparts uh, we you know we, we transitioned relatively easily so also in terms of our offices um, we've had significant growth in our offices in the last 12 months outside of Spalding so you can see there from that slide Alconbury has doubled Birmingham has has almost doubled Nottingham has doubled in size so those of you who are perhaps looking at coming to training contracts with us. Historically, we would have based our training contracts predominantly in Spalding because that had a mix of departments. However, going forwards, we are looking for trainees to also experience our other offices such as Birmingham and Nottingham. And since they've grown, we can offer a wider range of departments in those um, offices, which, which if that's your preference, um, we have we now have available for you. So I've told you where we come from and I've told you about our offices, but in terms of our overarching vision and our culture, it's important to, to know that when you're looking for law firms to, to join. And our culture and our, our, over, our overarching vision really is to be trusted advisors, recognise experts, resulting in long-standing relationships by being the best that we can do. And long-standing relationships are internal and external. So we have our relationships with our clients that are over generations. A lot of our clients, their grandparents or great-grandparents were clients with Mr. Roythorns. And we've established that long-term relationship also by having uh, internal um, employees that have been with us a long period of time. And 
the trusted advisor part is very much a case of we don't just deal with that single matter because of the relationship with our clients and putting the clients at the heart of everything we do. We absolutely try and advise on the bigger picture. And recognise experts, we have a lot of thought leadership, um, certainly our sector heads, um, such as our agricultural sector, Julie Robertson, and other areas um, certainly advise you know, on white papers and sort of deal with NFU and governments, etc. So our recognised experts, you know, we certainly support everyone to reach their potential. And our culture, well, as it says there, we work collaboratively as one team, and that is slightly different from some other firms. Our client base is such that we would recommend if um, for example, we have a property client who has an employment issue. We, the, the person who, who initially had them uh, had them as a client, so the client relationship manager would feel confident in recommending, say, Desley in employment law. Commercial businesses also have private individual needs. So, for example, in wills, probate, et cetera. And we hope to retain our client for anything that they require. That involves a lot of trust between um, fee earners. Because if you've had a client with you for a long period of time, you have to trust that the fee earner that you're recommending that person to is going to treat them in at least the same, if not better than you would. So our culture is to build trust, drive to be better always, uh, embracing individual talents and we all make a difference. And that last one, big picture thinking that gets the detail right. We always try and look at the overview of things for a client, but make sure that we, we get the detail right as well. So who are the, uh, who do we work for? I've already mentioned farmers and landed estates, um, property developers, innovative renewable energy entrepreneurs, logistics and warehousing businesses, uh, food producers, growers. And we also um, have private individuals. So we do private, we do wills and probate, succession planning, families, divorce. In terms of high street re retailers for landlords and tenant masses and other, other uh, work, national charities. So in terms of the variety of clients we have, they cover a broad spe spectrum of work and clients that, that you would get involved in. So looking at our sectors, um, I've already mentioned that agriculture and estates is is one of our biggest. It's a two billion pound sector in the region. It, we had the first robotic fruit farm opened in Lincolnshire last year. I don't know if you caught uh, Country File a, a couple of weeks ago, but it was, it was highlighted on there. Um, we have massive investment coming into the county from food enterprise zones and some work with world leading food technology universities. And that brings us on to our area of food and drink. So we've developed that from our agricultural roots and we deal with things like um, meat industry regulation to IP on certain um, food names, you know, disputes between supplier and grower. Um, so quite a broad range in our food and drink sector. In terms of natural resources, uh, we have a number of projects on the go, mainly solar farms, battery storage. It's a very complex part of law because obviously if you have a solar farm, you've got to get that electricity over sometimes a number of people's uh, land. We also have done some off offshore wind and even dealt with some onshore as well. In, in terms of housing and development, as I mentioned, from a, a farming perspective, lots of the landowners have sold land 
around conurbations to build new housing or developments in and we support them in that and it's sort of a virtuous circle so some of the uh, landowners will go into housing and development the developers that we work with some of which are national are always looking for new land to be able to develop so we we help uh, clients uh, to develop their business and, and, and perhaps change what their usage of land is for. And charities, although a small sector, Julie, I don't know if you want to mention um, charities at all. Yes, Julie, yeah, um, thanks, charities. thanks, Jill, and um, hello to everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Um, yes, so I think the next two slides it's charities and then commercial. So if I just uh, cover both of those. Um, uh, I, my name is Julia Siri, and I'm a partner in our company and commercial team, which also includes charities work. From a charities perspective, we advise a whole variety of charities and not-for-profit organisations across the country, and that really is anything from international, from uh, from national charities right to maybe small. Uh, preschool nurseries, so a whole variety of organisations. Um, we advise trustees, so it may be from a governance perspective, just giving trustees some guidance in terms of how to go about uh, running a charity on a day-to-day on a -day basis. Uh, we also do get involved if there are sometimes trustee disputes and issues within charities. And then the other aspect of work would be to deal with charities when they potentially go through a restructure or a merger, which um, which we do see quite often um, in these what are, as you can imagine, pretty challenging times for charities. Um, and for example, one, one restructure that's very common, I don't know whether any of you have heard of them, but sometimes charities will decide to convert into more of a corporate entity called a charitable and incorporated organisation. So we advise on, on that aspect as well. It's a pretty small part of our overall portfolio, um, but uh, we do get, you know, we do get um, a, a fair bit of work that comes, comes through from charities. Moving on to the next slide, I think, I'm hoping it's going to say commercial. It does. It does. Great. Brilliant. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this really is corporate and commercial. So from a team perspective, we have a corporate and commercial team. So we mix, we merge both sort of corporate M&A work, corporate finance work, along with commercial. For example, I tend to just do the, more of the commercial work. So I'll deal with all, all types of business commercial arrangements, um, agency, distribution agreements, any, short, any sort of commercial partnerships, collaborations, IT licenses, IP developments, a whole raft of all of which I'm sure you're very familiar with from your legal courses that you're doing. Um, also joint ventures, so we might get involved in that. And also again, in terms of the more uh, uh, manager owner businesses, perhaps shareholders agreements and dealing as well with succession planning. So as the next generation comes through and um, how we deal with that from a business perspective and documentation. Personally, I also deal with GDPR, so um, we cover that aspect as well. And then, as I say, the other uh, the other areas of the team, which I don't get as, as involved in, but, but we cover mergers and acquisitions um, and also um, corporate finance work, corporate restructures, succession planning again, or just um, re restructuring for other commercial reasons. And then thirdly, we've got a, a division which is covers construction work, which obviously feeds in well with our significant property department. From a very quickly, George, shall I talk about our team as well? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, from a team perspective, we've got um, we've doubled in the last five years. So we're a continually increasing, growing team and we look to continue to grow. So if corporate or commercial or both is an area you're considering, then um, Roy Thorns is definitely a place to come to because we definitely actively want to grow. We're starting to look at, uh, we've got, you know, we are, we are, we were five years ago, all based in Spalding pretty much. That is obviously all changed completely. Um, now we've got lawyers in our Alconbury office and also in our Birmingham office. And both of those um, have opportunities for further growth as well. We've got five, partners, um, five, six additional fee earners, 
and yeah as I say we've we've doubled in in the last five years so that's probably it from a COCO perspective I'll hand back to Jill. Thank you and um, in terms of private individuals we obviously cover as I mentioned wills probate and family so divorce child care child uh, services etc so um, we are a full service law firm with the exception really of, of criminal law albeit that some of our litigators do help and support in on occasion some of our existing clients so that's covered over our, our sectors why rifles well i guess we have standards we are always trying to drive to be better as i, I mentioned in our culture and the way we work and you know we have some accreditations we're very proud of investors in people we're also very proud of our investors in the environment and we're one of less than four percent of companies who've managed to retain that uh, title over the last um, six years it, it becomes harder to retain the longer you have it and we recently won a Peterborough Green Award uh, for business uh, greenest business in the year and our ambition is to be one of the UK's greenest law firms so um certainly if if the environment is something you're interested in uh we support that um from our from our ethos in terms of it's not all work there is some play obviously over covid times that has been restricted to some extent but we do enjoy having summer events christmas events bake-offs when we can we have a strong uh, social uh, uh, responsibility of charities. Um, we've been supporting uh, the Sue Rider Trust this year um, with events that we could do from home and individuals and challenging each other from physical uh, walks to you know, marathons to walking around Iceland, etc., to, to raise money or be slightly more of a challenge this year than, than in previous years. So I'm sure the panellists will um, bring some of that more to life through their discussions. And so an opportunity to meet our panellists. I think Ed might be delayed. Um, I, I haven't seen him on, on, the, on, on my screen yet. Julia, you've already met. Um, Desi is a senior associate. Desi um, was a trainee with us a few years ago uh, <laughs> um, and I meant to mention actually Ed is you was a trainee and is now one of the six board of directors three of our board of directors started as trainees so that just shows you the importance of trainees in the business to us a fourth out of the six board of directors has been with us over 47 years so again an illustration of long-standing relationships our other panellists today are Ben, uh, Naomi, Shola and Bethan, all of which were trainees with us. Uh, Bethan is our most recent trainee who uh, qualified at the end of November. So congratulations to her uh, becoming a solicitor. And I'm going to hand over to Julia now to start the panel discussion. Thank you, Jill. Um, so as I said, um, I'm just getting the, the screen. Can you can I, I think you can all see me, Jill? Can you see me? Yes, I'm just, I can. If you can yeah. nod, great. Okay, because yes. I actually can't. Yes, I, I can only I can only see the panel. So, um, yeah, good good to see to good to um, meet you all again. And thanks ever so much for attending. As I said, so I guess it would just be. I, I guess what I'm going to do is I'm just going to perhaps throw a few questions out to our panel. I'm going to put them on the spot because um, actually I personally didn't train it. Roy Thorns. Um, I obviously did, I trained at um, Shoesmiths, but um, a, a good few years ago. So um, it's, I think it's much more useful for you guys for to hear perhaps from, from some of our um, fee earners that have been trainees more recently than myself and have been trainees at Roy Thorns because hopefully they can give you a real feel. And I think as Jill mentioned, we're going to have a session at the end for Q&A. So please do make a note of your questions. Um, Jill, how are we managing questions? Are you asking for them to come through by, via chat or what, what's the 
What's yes. That? So if if you could put that on the chat, I will monitor that as you're going through the uh, discussions. And perhaps I think probably easiest for me at the end to to throw those in. Great. Yes. Thank you. And please don't be shy. They can be anonymous, but um, please do ask the questions that you want to ask, because if you've got a question, the chances are that other attendees on the call have got a similar question. So please, please do ask it. So um, who should I pick on first? Uh, OK, I am going to ask. I'm going to ask Beth. As Beth has been our most recent trainee, Beth has just qualified. So she has the um, actually quite quite a different experience of being a trainee because clearly we've had a very challenging time with COVID. But from your experience, Beth, what is it like to be a trainee broadly at Roy Thorns? Perhaps just in terms of a day a day in the day in the life of. Hi everyone. Um, well, like Julia says, it's been quite varied over the last uh, couple of years, uh, but typically a day in the life would start around 9 a.m. maybe a little bit before log on um, I'm typically working from home at the moment um, trying to get in at least one day a week just to touch base with everybody in the office um, then would check in emails work through my to-do list for the day it could involve drafting documents um, it could involve answering direct questions from clients um, then we'd check in with a supervisor. So in some seats that I've done, you could be working underneath one supervisor and other seats I've worked under multiple supervisors. So it's just a case of checking back in with whichever supervisors provided the work. Um, and usually you would have one or two meetings, either internal or with clients. Um, but I have found it's been, um, I've had more and more kind of client contact as the uh, trans training contract's gone on. So. I would suggest that's probably a typical day in the life, normally finish mm -hmm. five thirty six ish And how, how I, I know people that are considering training contracts, I, th I think are very keen to understand just in terms of support and supervision. How have you found that, Beth? I mean, it, obviously, and you don't have to talk about, <laughs> don't talk about our department because of course <laughs> um, that's me. But um, in terms of generally Roy Thorns as a whole, particularly working from home how, how, have, how have you and, and perhaps if you can talk on behalf of your cohort generally you all chat and how, how have you found that? I think it uh, obviously has changed quite a lot since since the first seat so first seat was pre-pandemic um, in the office and had my supervisor sat directly opposite me and actually probably bugged him a little bit too much with um, with various questions thrown his way throughout the day and actually I, I feel working from home has probably made our cohort far more independent um we've kind of we've probably rather than just asking a quick five minute question we've gone ahead and researched it and found the answer out ourselves which actually i think has worked to our benefit because you're more likely to remember if you've had to research the answer yourself um rather than just getting the answer from somebody else mm -hmm. um, but in terms of how the supervision has has worked typically it, it depends on the fee added to be honest so typically it would be do the work email it back or or check in on on teams with a few questions if you just want clarification um if it's if there's a lot of questions maybe put put a, a call in with your supervisor into, into the calendar but it, i think it has we have made it work um and i think it's probably been better from a workload perspective for for, for all parties so both for trainees and for supervisors um working from home because i feel like we've managed to make it slot into everybody's working day a, a bit more efficiently than we did previously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Beth. Um, Naomi, I'm going to pick on you next. Um, so Naomi, trainees, they're always a really important part of our growth strategy. And um, for people, well, perhaps Naomi, you can introduce yourself first. What I'd really like you to just have a chat with us about is, is perhaps when you consider your experience at Roythorns, how does that compare, do you think, with some of your uh, friends and possibly acquaintances that you've met professionally, um, because Naomi works in our Nottingham office, which she'll tell you more about. How do you think Roythorns perhaps differs from other firms and perhaps let's, you know, particularly other other city firms? Mm, that's a good question. Um, hi everyone, I'm Naomi. I qualified September of last year, same time as Shola. So one year down, many years to go. Um, I, yeah, I'm in our Nottingham office, but when I first started, I was over in Spalding um, and I did a, 
a seat there and then move my second seat. So I'm, I'm thoroughly in Nottingham now. I think um, the thing that definitely <laughs> compares, because I have quite a lot of friends who started their training contracts a couple of years after me, so they're training right now. And the work-life balance is definitely number one. Um, I'll be sending them Snapchats at 6 p.m. saying, oh, you know, and they're still working. Great. I regularly worked late when I was a trainee, um, but it's not as assumed and it's definitely not forced. And this particular friend is in a firm in Manchester. Won't name any name, names, but they do personal injury law and they're all over your TV. And um, she's just slaving away till 8 p.m. sometimes at night. And I, I don't know if that's because she wants to or because she feels she has to because everyone else is online and you can see they're all online on Teams. And I think having that balance, it, it really helps because if you do want to work late, it's because you want to, because you have something you need to get done and you feel that responsibility. But if you're told to do it all the time, then it just, when's your free time? When's your life going to be? So there's definitely that. Mm -hmm. I think what was definitely drilled into me when I first started is I think something probably that you said, Julia, you see your trainees as future partners. And it might sound like a bit of a marketing thing, but I remember when I joined two female partners were made partner who had been at the firm for about 10 years and they started as paralegals up to partner so having that in my vision of okay 10 years or less being a partner and it's, it seems like a real chance in a way um if you're at a bigger firm there's just way less chance of that because you might drown in the amount of people um so i, I like the size of Roythorns. i like the possibility of moving up and becoming partner if, if that was something that you wanted and that also leads into just the level of work that you're given as a trainee. It's not, you know, when you do work experience at a law firm, you're given a research task and it's not that. I don't think I ever did a piece of work that wasn't actual work. So when I was in private client, they say, here's an attendance note from a meeting I just had. Can you go and draft the will and give it a go? And they, they would try and use that draft, you know, for the final product. It was never, can you go and research what is a will? What is this clause or something? It was all real work. And I think I was quite surprised the first time that one of my supervisors copied me into an email and said, this is my trainee, Naomi, she'll call you tomorrow. And it's, oh, I get to call a client. I get to have actual client contact. Straight away, you're just part of the team and trusted to get on the phone with a client and write your own letters and stuff like that. So definitely the, the go out and do it and the trust is, is big at Roythorn. So they're definitely top three for me. Mm, great, thank you. Thanks very much, Naomi. Um, Desley, just turning to you, um, I'd be interested to hear, I mean, you've obviously been with the firm, you know, like myself, you've been with the firm a little, little longer. How have you seen it grow over the time? I mean, especially in terms of locations, Birmingham, Nottingham, Alconbury. Just talk us through how you've seen over the last five years or so, how you, what you've seen the growth. Oh, I think the growth. Hello, everybody, by the way. Yes, I'm Desley. I'm, I'm in a mix of employment and litigation teams. Um, the growth has been amazing. Um, certainly when I trained at Roy Thorns, which was very many years ago, probably before any of the attendees were even born. Um, <laughs> it's, not there. <laughs> it's black and white. Um, Roy Thorns was, was quite a small firm. It was only based in Spalding and Boston at the time. So very much a Lincolnshire firm, whereas obviously now we're national. We're in the major centres. Um, the, the, the offices are getting bigger all of the time. So um, in the last couple of years, we've had to move, gosh, how many times in, in, in offices just to get bigger offices because they're just not big enough for the growth that is happening at the moment and continuing to happen. So um, Birmingham, of course, is our most recent office and it's already increased in size hugely we've already moved how many times once or twice um and and th there are plans to get it even bigger and get even more of a, a foothold in that city of course um as jill said right at the beginning we're a national firm our clients are all over the country um in the good old days you only had clients in your own region nowadays they're absolutely every everywhere all over the place so um and again, during uh, lockdown, the fact that we can, I'm at home at the moment, nobody knows I'm at home at the moment, but I've just told you that. So I, I have my computer, I have all my equipment here, I can do everything that I need to do from home, which means that I can have a Teams meet or a Zoom meet with clients anywhere. And it works really, really well. So um, yeah, the firm has expanded enormously and is just continuing to get bigger and better, I think. Mm, yeah. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Desi. Just, just to add to that, we, we hope to move to our third office or, you know, third size office in Birmingham in March next year. So, you know, we, we've moved already in less than, or just be just over two years to it moved three times because of the size of, of growth in that team. So, yeah, very exciting. I think mm. another thing, if I may, another thing that's exciting about the different offices is that they're not isolated in that we do talk to each other. We do share ideas with each other. You don't feel as though only people in the Birmingham office speak to people in the Birmingham office, for example. We all see each other regularly. We share ideas with each other regularly. So as far as you can do with separate offices, it makes it more of one firm rather than lots of just sort of little satellite firms trying to act under the same umbrella, in my view. And, mm. you know, that collaborative working, which is really key, um, our BD director does cross-referral meetings, which go across offices and, and regularly, certainly with teams, that's probably become easier in a way, uh, rather than physically having, having to be there. Mm. Mm. Would you mind if I yeah. jump in on that quickly? Yeah, please do. Um, you mentioned earlier about full service law firm. And I just know when I was a trainee, I didn't really appreciate what that meant. So it might just help if I, mm. I think what I realized, some of my friends went to train at a family law specialist um, firm or a criminal law firm, which is amazing because they knew that they wanted to do that. But from a trainee perspective, when you're doing your undergraduate degree, when you're doing your LPC, you might have an inkling of, oh, I like private client or I like land law, but you don't really know what you want to do. So if you come to a firm like ours, which is full service, that means we have so many different departments that you can train in. And then you might go, yes, that one's taken my fancy. And you can then try and get a job in that place. What that also means on a day to day, whenever you're actually qualified is, for example, I manage a trust and the trust wants to sell property. So then we can call up my conveyancing colleagues, get a quote from them and they can do it in house. Um, I might have another one where we're collecting rent from a trust property and they're not paying. So I've done that before. We contact the litigation partner and we say, what do we do? And they might serve them with a notice to try and kick them out or get the money. Or we send it over to the debts department and they try and chase up the debt. So very quickly, my one matter crosses over to four different departments because we have them. And the best thing about growth is that now we have you know more in Nottingham we've got litigation property private client family all this stuff so you can quite literally just turn to the person next to you and say can you help me um so that's that's what a full service law firm is we have all those departments kind of apart from criminal law that's the one thing that we don't really <laughs> want to touch too much but that's what it means thanks mm. yeah that's really useful to understand that Naomi and also I think I'd add to that that because we've got offices that are becoming more full service in themselves what is great is that if um, either trainee or on qualifying, when you obviously then um, are looking for a long term contract in a particular department or even potentially later on in your career, you know, your, 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 your personal circumstances may, may change in such that you're you want to be in a different location. And whereas 10 years ago or even five years ago, actually, it was probably a little bit more challenging if somebody worked for example in litigation but actually really wants to be in Nottingham it was potentially a bit of a challenge whereas we're getting to the position now where wherever you start as a trainee and obviously you do need to sort of know where you're going to be because you know you need to work out where you're going to live etc for that sort of two-year period if actually your personal circumstances are such that you really want to be in Birmingham or you really want to just move slightly south and actually the Alconbury office would would suit you better it would be commutable we can accommodate that and um, which is which is what we have done quite a lot of in recent times and, and of course hybrid working is making that even more a possibility I think just on that and Jill will jump in if I start to say things from an HR perspective that aren't entirely right so um but but I, but stop me if I'm wrong but but we are we are pretty comfortable as a firm with hybrid working we're not a firm that is saying You've got to be in the office full time. Uh, as we've talked about, our technology is such and our fee earners and ways of working are such that we think it does work and we want to encourage it because we find that the more engaged our employees are, the more productive 
people are and the more prepared people are to actually go that extra mile when it's needed. So actually location, it has opened up everything up for us because we can, we can offer different, uh, different office locations. We can even offer a, a mix if that's what people want. And we do support pretty flexible working. Um, from it's useful as well, I guess, for you to know. I, I'm not the only partner. Um, even as a partner, um, I personally work per, part time. Um, I do four days a week. And although I'm not for a minute suggesting that you know there are obviously the odd times that that doesn't quite pan out, and I do um, you know obviously I do have to be pretty efficient in my four days, but I do, I do generally, genuinely work part time, and um, I, you know, I would just just flag that because that doesn't work for all firms. It does, it does work, it does work within Roythorns. Um, moving on, um, I guess what also would be useful to understand, and I think for you especially, would be really good for you to hear, perhaps from. Um, I'm going to pick on Ben. So Ben, Ben, um, Ben was a trainee with us, and now works in our um, private client team. Ben, take yourself back to when you were applying to be a trainee. What do you think helped you stand out from the crowd? Uh, just in terms of just giving that some context, sorry, bear with me, Ben. Um, we, I, I'm uh, training the training partner, and so myself with Ed uh, look through all the CVs that come in. Um, Jill obviously looks through them as well from an HR perspective. And just to give you sort of a sense of what what you're sort of faced with i'm sure it's not a surprise we have a lot of a lot of cvs come in sort of probably over over a hundred we will interview i don't actually i'm sure jill will cover this but we will interview you know a sort of certain number and then have second round etc and um you know you 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 need to obviously make sure that you stand out to get an interview um and i guess then you, you need to be successful within that interview and it will be interesting to hear from ben what he thought did help to stand out from the crowd. And I guess that does just also link with preparing for a career in law, because of course that once you've got the job, you've then got to do the job. And so Ben, tell us a little bit, if you can take yourself back to that time, tell us a little bit about your experience. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so uh, I work in private client with Naomi as well. Um, and uh, I have a, a tax focus really to my work rather than uh, what you might know as a traditional private client role. Um, even though actually um, when I was a, a student, I didn't really know what private client meant and, and some people still don't. But um, in terms of the, the process and, and, and getting a training contract, I, I paralegaled here. So I joined the firm in in 2011 uh, so um, a long while ago now and I paralegaled and started off in litigation in the same team that Desley's part of and uh, so my interview process was uh, I guess a year of mm. working for um, one of our one of our partners uh, and putting in a lot of hours uh, putting uh, a lot of learning time and that doesn't necessarily just mean work it, it's it's learning time as well uh, so taking things home, reading. There's a lot of reading, um, and and trying to trying to stand out. And um, I I uh, initially uh, hadn't applied for a training contract, but what stood the firm out just to reverse it for a second for me was the the people. So um, the reason I applied for a training contract is because um, the people I worked with were were really good people, really great people. Um, supportive and uh seemed like they wanted me to do well uh develop and uh and now i i you know i have developed and have my my own real niche within the firm in terms of the areas that i advise on um what what i focused on and i my at the time my supervising partner was um i think julia's predecessor uh was um the sort of soft skills the skills that uh, I, I had a very boring uh, process to become becoming a lawyer. I did GCSE law, A level law. I then did a law degree, a legal. Then I LPC. Then I got a training contract. Then I qualified, and six years later, I'm here. So it's very very long law 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 um, um, process. But for me, um, it's, there's a lot that you 
along that process you, you don't get taught and that you now use in terms of managing people uh, managing you know expectations that sort of thing managing people who are not happy managing people who are happy and want more and more work from you uh managing um your, your colleague expectations and uh, where you fit into a transaction so a lot of the work i do i do a lot of uh, cross referral work in terms of people asking me questions so uh, I've never been to a Birmingham office, but a lot of my work uh, from a tax perspective comes from our Birmingham office. I had a, a query this morning from Birmingham um, and it's sort of managing where you fit in with that. And I think when it comes to trying to become a lawyer, um, there are lots and lots of skills that you develop along the way whilst you're at university in terms of taking part in uh, whatever competitions you, you can do. Um, and, and outside of that work experience, either in the law or not, um, I did a lot of legal work experience with Roy Thorne, so I was lucky in that respect. Um, but there are lots of lots of skills that you can learn from, from experience in bar work, uh, for example, uh, managing angry people, uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, then Shola, Shola, t tell us a little bit. I mean, because Shola, again, you're in, it'd be good just to hear from you because your your um, introduction to Roy Thorns what and a training contract was a little different from the standard. Um, so tell us a little bit about the route to your training contract, and then perhaps then what. What did you enjoy most about being a trainee? You'd obviously been at Roy Thorns in various other capacities, which you'll, which you'll tell us about. And then what did you enjoy about being a trainee at Roy Thorns? Um, hi everyone, I'm Shola. I work uh, with Desley. So I joined in 2017 and I think Julia actually interviewed me. I did, um, yeah. As a legal secretary. So I had done um, my law degree, but I hadn't done the LPC. Um, and I said at the time, you know, I want to progress, but didn't really have the experience to be applying for a training contract at that time um so yeah joined as a secretary and sort of naturally progressed into being a paralegal in the litigation team um and then applied internally for a training contract and got it <laughs> i think julia interviewed me then as well um and did my lpc alongside doing the training contract so i did the lpc um it was like one weekend every month um in terms of, I think, what I enjoyed as being a trainee, which was, I think, different to my LPC friends, because we were all doing it at different firms, but along the same, is probably the amount of work I was given compared to what they were doing. So I was going to court and I was drafting files and we have one that I, um, it's, you might not find it funny, but we find it funny, but it's, I started as a secretary on this file, typing up attendance notes. So I would type what the partner did and what he was saying. I now run that file with Desley because it's been going on for so long. Um, but it just sort of shows the natural progression. I've gone from typing on it to, to running it and, and actually advising on it. Mm. My friends at the time on the LPC were doing things like photocopying and um, maybe sort of attending meetings, but taking notes. Whereas I was going into meetings and I'd drafted things for it or I'd reviewed things for it. And that I think I enjoyed because actually I found my job interesting um paired with obviously being in litigation you get to go to court and mediations and I've been on a mediation with Desley before that's lasted probably longer than it should have but the whole day <laughs> um but it's that sort of thing that I think I really enjoyed because it was different it was interesting I was learning but I wasn't just sitting reading books or reading case law which is a lot of what you do at uni um and then I think when you actually transfer to work you want to be applying it and you want to be making it interesting and, and really actually enjoying your work. And I, I don't think many people can say they enjoy their work in, in other sectors, but I genuinely enjoy my job. Um, but yeah, the difference was mainly my workload was more actually like a qualified solicitor. And a lot of my friends were doing um, maybe paralegal sort of secretary, that sort of trainee work. But I think Roy Thorns really allows you to grow. And then when you do qualify, you're in a position where you say, actually, I am in a position to qualify. I know what I'm doing. I haven't just spent two years reading case law and photocopying documents. Mm. 
Yeah. OK, thank you, Shola. Actually, one thing I would just um, add to what Shola was saying, and it just for, for all you guys in the, the application process, getting a training contract through the sort of standard process, as in, you know, applying end of January, going for um, CVs, application forms, interviews, et cetera, and, and being successful on the, on the two year training contract. It is incredibly tough. Um, it's incredibly difficult to get training contracts. Hopefully, all of you listening will get a training contract the first time you make an application, and we hope that it'll be to Roythorns. But if you're not successful, and there can be a whole host of reasons, it doesn't mean to say you're not going to be successful ever, but if you're not successful, um, do think about alternative ways to get your foot in the door. Because as Shola said, Shola and another um, colleague of mine, Emily, both applied together. We were actually genuinely, we were recruiting for secretarial support. We weren't particularly recruiting for um, for trainees at that point in the year. I can't, remember, was it, I can't remember exactly when it was in the year, but we weren't looking at trainees. Both Shola and Emily happened to apply. They're both local to the area. And both of them had at that point not been successful in getting training contracts anywhere, but actually then decided for their own reasons that well, I'm going to get my foot. I'm going to I'm going to go and do a job as a as a secretary because they've got the skills to do that, and then at least get some experience. And I don't know what their expectations were, but we we'd have you know very interesting chats in the interview because I was definitely saying this is a secretarial role. I can't promise you anything else. And they were both absolutely keen as mustard and saying it's absolutely fine. That's what I that's what we we know. But of course, in the back of my mind, we're being the training partner and, and anyone's recruiting and Jill would say the same you are always looking to see whether actually but there is the possibility that that person may want to grow and develop and both of them very quickly proved themselves as legal secretaries doing exactly what we required in that role moved off to do paralegaling did exactly what was required in that role and really by the time it comes to a training contract interview really you know it, it's a it is at that point issue in because as um ben was saying before it, it's a tougher process because you're being interviewed the whole time essentially but they then got onto the training contract um route and and both are not new, newly qualified anymore but both got taken on as as newly qualified solicitors and there's absolutely no difference in fact they probably found the training contract slightly easier to adapt to because they'd all, already been working in the law firm so what I would say to you is take whatever opportunities you can get because people do like recruiting, you know, internally. If you're not successful, if you can prove yourself, there are openings. Certainly at Roythorns, we're always looking at our um, paralegals and individuals that have done law to see whether what the development is. And I suspect that's you know, similar in, a, in other law firms as well. So just to sort of flag that to you as well. Um, Jill, I don't know where we are in terms of time and questions and where you want to head next. I'll just hand over to Jill just to give us yes. a quick summary. We, of we have got one question that's coming uh, through the chat so far. That, mm -hmm. um, they are an economist student and they're uh, studying eco economics at the moment. And do we take the GZL? Now, I know we do, but I'm not sure... Beth, were you a GZL student? Yes, so you might not want to ask, answer that question. Yeah, so um, slightly different from, from the fact that I, I did do law, but I did Scots law. Um, so had to do elements of the GDL. Um, but yes, I did I did the GDL, did the LPC straight after um, and, and joined with the training contract at Roythorn. So yes. And, and certainly from a from a recruitment perspective, Ed and I obviously do the train the interviews. Personally, probably because I also converted. I did the, um, I can't remember what it's called now. Somebody will, somebody will remember what it used to be called. Before the GD, GDL, it's so long ago, I can't remember what it was. I did the conversion, CPE is it called. And, um, and I converted, I did a psychology degree and then converted. So I suppose I, 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 am, I am very open-minded, but, but as a law firm, we're, um, we're completely open-minded. You don't need to have done a law degree. Um, something like economics is fan is fantastic that brings a whole load of other skills as well all degrees bring different skills so um don't don't let that um, be a hold up at all to to making an application it's not a problem yes and we've had many 
a successful GDL student. So yes, is the answer to that question. We've got another question come in, um, which probably I, I'm perhaps best placed along with Julia to answer, which is um, as a firm, are you looking to continue with the LPC or will you be moving forward with the SQE, which is a, a very topical subject. Um, I think from our perspective, we will be obviously at some point having to move to the SQE, but we're not in a rush to do it. Um, obviously, there is going to be some external pressure, possibly. So as far as we're concerned, you know, the transitional period is to 2032. We're not in a rush to go down the SQE route initially because we'd rather see how it goes uh, rather than use our trainees or um, students as, as guinea pigs to some extent but that said we do appreciate that if universities and, and providers stop doing the LPC we may have to swap over sooner and I've seen sort of several articles recently regarding the fact that lots of London firms are saying that they don't intend to run SQE alongside traditional training contracts. Our view at this moment in time is that we probably will for a few years. And um, as Julia was, was sort of mentioning, we may try the SQE route with an internal candidate first. So perhaps somebody who's joined us as a paralegal who'd like to do SQE as an apprenticeship. So we get a sense of how that is for somebody before we go out into the marketplace. But I suspect we probably will run them two together. So hopefully that answered that question. Great, any more questions, Jill, that have come through? Um, we've got a couple more com coming in. So we've got, as a current first year law student, are there any internship opportunities, et cetera, within your firm? Now, pre-pandemic, I could have absolutely said yes. And I am hoping, fingers crossed, that we will run the summer uh, vacation scheme that normally happens the first two weeks of July. The pandemic has, has obviously impacted us on hybrid working, um, but I would hope that we can do something, certainly. And in some of our offices, for example, the Birmingham office, we had a number of people in the Birmingham office over the summer. And we could do a few bits of work experience there. Um, and certainly I, I would hope we, we continue to do that uh, more so in 2022 than we have perhaps for the last couple of years. Um, and I guess to answer that question from a first year student point of view, yes, we, we certainly look at first year, second years, third years, whoever wants to do it. We are actually doing a placement scheme at the moment with uh, one of the, students from Nottingham um, who's with our agricultural team in Alconbury and is doing a placement year and we hope to do a few more of those perhaps next year as well. Another question that's come in, do you need to have done the LPC prior to applying for the training contract? Um, we have a mixture to be honest and the others, are Shola especially and um, who perhaps did it side by side can answer that question as well from an experience point of view. Yeah. A little while ago, we definitely encouraged it. Uh, a little while ago, we sort of said like, you know, it seems like a great idea to, to be able to qualify quicker. But the experience is mixed. It is quite a hard thing to do because you're expected to do your training contracts, work hard in that respect, and also do your LPC. And in general, we've swapped our attitude a bit to encouraging it, which I would say we did probably five or six years ago, to now discouraging it. However, we do know that there are going to be personal circumstances occasionally that mean that they, you know, people want to work alongside doing the LPC. But yeah. Shelby, do you want to add anything to that from a personal experience point of view? Yeah, I think my personal circumstances were that I, yeah, I wanted to, um, but I will say that it is difficult. Um, mainly not so much because of work, but just because the LPC is quite hard um, and they expect quite a lot from you. So you are doing, I think the way I did it was like seven exams over a period of like two weeks. I was working at the same time um, and Roythons were really understanding of it and I had, you know, the relevant time off. But it was a case of you could be going to court during the day and then come home in the evening and you have to put in the hours for the LPC else you probably won't pass. Um so I think bear in mind, if you are going to want to do it that way, 
it is particularly difficult and you give up most of your social life for the LPC. Um, but if you're happy to do that, then fine. We have another question in the chat, which is, I'm a mature student and effectively, you know, with years of experience having to do the GDL because they did their law degree a significant time ago. Effectively, do we look at mature students for the training contract? Yes, yeah, yeah, we've just had, um, we've actually had a mature student who worked in industry in our last cohort that just qualified. So absolutely, yes. Um, mature students, depending what you've done in the meantime, obviously can bring a huge amount of experience and professional maturity. I mean, that is, and that, that can stand you in very good stead. So uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we're always delighted to meet um, mature students. And the final question that I've got on the chat is, uh, leads us really to, to the next section of our presentation, which is as a third year law student graduating soon, what would be the best way and opportunity to apply for uh, with you? So I'm going to, if, if there's no more questions or anything else the panel would like to, to talk about, I'm going to move on to, to the application process process if that's okay. I'm going to reshare my screen with you and everyone can jump in if they wish to to sort of add their own ex experiences. All right. So thumbs up or, or, or a nod if you can all see my screen. That's always yeah great lovely. So the application process for our training contracts in Roythorns is that we apply through the web. Um, we can send out, we've got email addresses for those attending, so we can send you out this link to our Roythorns uh, website and our careers page. So what we ask for is a covering letter and a uh, uploading of your CV. That goes into our HR portal and both Ed, myself and Julia can see all of those applications. We read all of those applications separately and then we have a meeting normally uh, and, and applications close the 28th of January so we don't look at any of those applications until all of them are in so you know just if you if, you know if you do it next week don't think you, unfortunately you're going to hear any quicker um, we wait till all of them have arrived and then have a cutoff. And then the three of us will read all of the covering letters and the applications separately. We then have a, a meeting together and discuss those applications. We will then go out to you, hopefully sort of middle of February to the end of February to say that you've been successful in a first interview stage. I think at this point in time, and we've put that on the screen, that that's between the 7th and 9th of March. Um, at this stage, I definitely expect that to be on Teams, so a virtual meeting. The reason behind that is that opens that up nicely to everybody. So you might be local to us, one of our offices, but you might be studying a long way away. And having a Teams on the first interview is, is probably logistically the, the most efficient way of doing it. And that's really just an opportunity to get to know you a bit, bring your CV to life, discuss any questions you have for Roy Thorns and about the training contract with us. As Julia mentioned earlier, we probably have in the region of 150 to 200 applications for the training contract. One of the questions we often get asked is how many training contracts we will be offering each year. Well, that is actually fairly dependent on the quality of applicants we have to some extent and how many of our departments um, have got good quality work that they can give trainees. So we never go out initially to say we're going to hire six and no matter what we're going to hire six we're probably around the six to seven mark but on some years it might be four or five in other years we've had uh, and the recent years we've, we've had up to 10 trainees which for a size of our firm is quite high you know to have 10 trainees um, once the first interview is over I would say that we probably first interview in the region of about 30, 35 people out of that sort of 200. 
then in terms of if you're successful in the first interview, you'll see that the, the 21st, 23rd of March um, will be the second interview. Now, at this stage, we haven't discussed whether those second interviews will be face to face or whether they'll be virtual again. And we're looking at, at possibly changing what we've done in the past regarding our second interview. We have used in the past and, and, and believe we will next year the Thomas International personal profile analysis that really helps us get understanding a bit of of your preferences your motivations um, how you like to communicate your style etc and it helps the interview process at the second interview really understand talk about you know what what your your preferences are and how you like to work um, and then at the end of that second interview we try and let people know as quickly as possible um, whether they've been successful or not so sometimes on the same day sometimes certainly depending on, on when it, that falls by the end of that week and then training contracts will either start in September 2022 or September 2023. We have already got some trainees set up for 2022 who have uh, applied last year but it's not to say that we won't take any more in 2022, but we're certainly looking for 2023. So all of this data that is on this slide can be found on our website. Um, if you've got any questions afterwards, do just please email us in. So are there any further questions at all, um, either about the process, I'm just going to go and stop sharing my screen and have a look at, at the chat questions just to see if anything more has come in since I last had a look. No, I think that's all the questions we've had in. So I'd just like to thank the panellists for their time and sharing their, their experiences of Roy Thorns. Um, I hope you've all found it useful. And again, our apologies that we, we couldn't have um, our client that we hoped we were going to have uh, with us today, but that is COVID times, I'm afraid. Um, we have to be adaptable about these things. So thanks ever so much for joining us. And um, if you do have any further questions, please just email hr at roythorns.co.uk and we will get back to you. Thanks everybody. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.